This is the welcome to the Blue Rock Therapeutics Ballroom, which I think it's the first time we've started branding rooms. I'm thinking that we're gonna have a gene or cell therapy company that has a stadium named after them soon. We'll do that so, next. I, I like it. Yeah, we'll do that um, next. But congratulations and thanks to Blue Rock uh, Therapeutics for sponsoring the, the session. Um, I think we'll start off just with some simple introductions. If each of the panelists could just uh, speak uh, about who you are, your role, and, and maybe just a comment or two on your lead program in the neurological space, just to set the stage for our, our discussions. And maybe Sheila, you can lead us off on this one. Sure, Sheila McHale. I am a co-founder and the current CEO of AsBio. I previously have run other companies in the gene therapy space, Chatham Therapeutics, which was focused on the advancement of a therapeutic for hemophilia. Uh, Bamboo Therapeutics, which uh, was sold to Pfizer, and that uh, was working on uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Uh, now I'm back at the holding company that I helped start with Jude Samalski back in 2001, and we currently have a program for Pompeii in the clinic, and in a few weeks we will have a program for heart failure in the clinic. Uh, in the neurological space, uh, through all of the different structures uh, that uh, ASBio has been affiliated with. We have taken programs into the clinic for giant axon neuropathy. Uh, GAN, uh, I would argue that muscular dystrophy, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is a neurological disease plus a muscle disease. Uh, we have also uh, worked on Canavan's disease um, and uh, Pompeii has neurological aspects too. Great, thank you very much. John? Hi, I'm Jonathan Guerin. I'm the Chief Business Officer at Unicure and I've been with the company about three and a half years. Uh, we have been working in, as a company in gene therapy for nearly 20 years, or actually over 20 years, I think, and that has been a very interesting run for the company. Um, we uh, work in uh, CNS and liver-targeted diseases. In CNS, our lead program is in Huntington's disease. Uh, we have behind that uh, a program in SCA3. Uh, so both of these diseases are CAG repeat disorders. And what we're doing in each case is to target uh, the lowering of the expression of the deleterious protein uh, that's responsible for the disease. So not a gene replacement approach, but rather a gene that expresses a microRNA that then targets the messenger RNA and knocks down the expression of the, of the protein. Um, I, uh, I have been also working in uh, the field for a number of years before that uh, in, in covering both CNS as well as many other disorders, um, but uh, Unicure has been, has been uh, as you know, one of the, we're the first company to put a drug on the market in Europe in gene therapy. So while that program had its challenges, um, we learned an enormous amount about getting it approval for a product from a manufacturing perspective perspective among other things, and that has uh, tremendous applications to our, our current platform where we have GMP manufacturing at a high scale, um, and it has helped us enormously in accelerating our programs into and through the clinic. If you don't mind me saying, Glybira also used Aspio self-complementary technology, and we've been around about the same time. <laughs> Is that right? Okay, good. Thanks, John. Okay. Um, hello there. My name is Emil Neweser. I'm the president and CEO of Blue Rock Therapeutics. We are um, an engineered cell therapy company that sits at the confluence of the cellular medicines field where we have a proprietary indu induced pluripotent stem cell background uh, platform and the genetic medicines field with our partnership with Editas and CRISPR-Cas editing. And in principle, what that allows us to do in principle today um, is to manufacture any cell type in the body and to edit that cell for any purpose within our therapeutic areas. Um, and that's an immense therapeutic opportunity that in principle. Um, today we're focused on in neurology, cardiology, and, and immunology. Um, and our lead program in neurology, which would probably be the main focus of the, well, we have four programs in neurology today. Our lead program is in Parkinson's, where we can manufacture the authentic midbrain dopaminergic neuron that uh, controls the initiation of motor control, the, uh, the motor control center in the midbrain of every uh, uh, person here in this room that allows you to connect thought to action, that's the neurons that are lost first in Parkinson's. Uh, we can manufacture those in the billions and we intend to uh, restore them in a Parkinson's patient and reverse the motor control deficit to re the brain effectively. Uh, we also have programs with oligodendrocytes and hypo and demyelinating disorders. We have a microglial program broadly in neuroinflammation and we have um, 
a program in enteric neurons, which is a peripheral gut neuron that controls gut motility uh, for Hirschsprung's disease. So, Thanks, Emil. That's what we're doing. Andre? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Andre Turan, president and CEO of Voyager Therapeutics. Uh, so Voyager is not uh, 20 years old, but uh, through <laughs> our, our founders uh, at uh, UMass, at Stanford, and uh, UCSF, uh, we're working off of science uh, that they've been working on for around 20 years. You know, Voyager is around five years old. But uh, everything we do is right at uh, this intersect of uh, AV, uh, gene therapy, and uh, neurological disease uh, biology. So that's the focus of our uh, entire uh, portfolio. We have uh, programs that span from rare disease to more the most common neurological disorders, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, and we have a range of uh, approaches to these uh, diseases. So we, we have some gene replacement uh, approaches, gene uh, knockdown, and some uh, vectorized antibody approaches uh, as well. So uh, for us, the lead program is in a, a placebo-controlled pivotal trial for Parkinson's also mm -hmm. uh, that uh, was recently initiated. Um, and we have a second program that's for Huntington's disease, like our colleagues at Unicure, where we're looking to uh, finalize the IND enabling work to be able to enter the clinic uh, next year. Great, thank you very much. I think you'll agree it's a, uh, a very experienced panelist up here. Uh, I think Sandy McRae in the last session uh, from uh, Sangamo made the comment that neurology is maybe a forgotten field in the gene and cell therapy arena, and I would argue that we have four of the most experienced and successful companies represented here. So uh, one of the things we'll do is we have a series of discussion points, and we'll bounce around as to who uh, starts us off, and everybody doesn't have to necessarily uh, weigh in on each point, but we will lead about 10 to 15 minutes worth of conversation for the audience, uh, so feel free to uh, think of your uh, questions you want to direct to this uh, expert group up here. Um, let's, let's start specifically with uh, neurological disorders and cell and gene therapy. And let's discuss the advantages of those treatments over more traditional approaches. And uh, John, we'll, we'll start with you. How's that? Sure. Um, so with respect to, to CNS disorders, as far as gene therapy is concerned, one of the clear advantages that you get with gene therapy is the ability to have sustained levels. That's true really in any disorder. Um, and also potentially uh, access to certain regions of the CNS that you might not easily be able to get access to um, uh, with, with therapies that are not gene therapy. So that, that, that certainly fu fundamentally is one of the key advantages of, of, of a gene therapy approach. Um, in CNS, it is very difficult to measure PD effect for any, any product. Um, so that's also a common challenge for gene therapy. But it, the one benefit that you do have is the ability to, to, at least depending on what you understand the distribution to be, based on preclinical work and so forth, is that you have effectively steady levels, PK levels, if you want to think of it in that way, although they're not necessarily blood levels, um, but exposure to the, to the uh, product that you want to produce. And so I think that, that is really the core of really the, uh, many of the benefits of gene therapy. Mm -hmm. Other, anybody yeah. else? Go ahead, right, Ashley. Um, yeah, I would just want to add that gene therapy has the power of curing disease yeah. rather than treating the symptomology of disease and patients being dependent on drugs, very expensive drugs that they have to take over and over again with side effects. I mean, this is a very powerful modality and it's basically ushering in a new way of treating diseases altogether. Mm -hmm. So it's very exciting. Absolutely. Andrea. And durability of effect is important for any of our gene therapies. Uh, when you're in the brain, these are uh, terminally differentiated cells, and, and you have this ability to, to and we've seen uh, a long durability of effect. So as you think about mm -hmm. these potential cures, one-time intervention, uh, that's one of the advantage of working uh, in, the, in that uh, mm -hmm. compartment. Uh, and, and just to emphasize uh, the point uh, made by John, uh, the, the targeting is, is critical. Uh, the delivery of any gene therapy for any target organ has been one of the things holding the field back and one of the overall challenge. And we uh, don't have the perfect solution for any of the target organs, but uh, uh, we know a lot more about uh, the mix of mode of uh, delivery uh, and the 
choice of capsid to be able to get the uh, uh, potent distribution uh, of our uh, uh, transgene. And especially when you uh, uh, are able to marry the disease uh, etiology with where you want to deliver that mm -hmm. payload, and that's when we can have some potential real precise solution. Yeah, but yeah. I would argue that gene therapy is powerful because of the fact that we can modify the capsid to target particular tissues, and we can modify the capsid to detarget other tissues. And then on top of it, right, we can add promoters so that we can, and enhancers, so we can limit transgene expression. There's no other modality for delivering medicine that has that kind of capability for targeted delivery with minimization of off-target effects. And I think even though we're just beginning, right, to advance beyond the natural serotypes of 1 through 12 right. to make chimerics, I mean, the future will have more targeted precision for therapeutics to particular cells within the brain. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would add ahead, simply that uh, from our point of view as a cell therapy company that um, the advantage of a cell is uh, in the CNS is the same as the advantage of a cell in periphery. It's the native language of biology, and it's been evolving for four billion years. Um, so, you know, to be able to harness that as a therapeutic, it's this incredible sensing device. It takes in billions of inputs to produce an output, in, in our case, dopamine metabolism. But if you gave the best engineers on the planet a trillion dollars, they could not engineer a midbrain dopaminergic neuron from scratch. But we can harvest, we can harness that power with an mm -hmm. induced pluripotent stem cell. So that's something profoundly different um, that a cell offers. I would also say that in many of these conditions, these are degenerative conditions where uh, this, this is a severe pathophysiology and it's very difficult to reverse a condition like that with a small molecule, um, but a cell can restore that natural physiology. We, we intend to re-enervate the brain. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something, again, something profoundly different is you can actually, you have a, we have the hope yeah. that we can reverse something which you really will never do with a small molecule. Mm -hmm. so. But can I just sure. add a point to that? We've seen in gene therapy that you can reverse disease. In our own GAN uh, trial, we saw that we were able to rejuvenate neurons uh, and nerves. And in addition, I think there's work by, it hasn't gone into the clinic yet, but if you look at the work of um, Natalie Cartier mm -hmm. uh, at INSERM, she's shown that with the deliver of, uh, delivery of cholesterol that she's been able to also rejuvenate neurons in non-human mm -hmm. primates. Mm -hmm. And so I think that gene therapy off, also offers that opportunity. Yeah. And that's a good point. We've seen similar effects as well in our Huntington's program. So it's very, very encouraging, not just from the point of view of being so-called curative, but also regenerative. And to stay with that topic, but maybe flip it, you know, we've talked about uh, potential advantages of, of cell and gene therapy. Um, maybe challenges that you've incurred, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to mind, if we're sitting next door in an immuno-oncology uh, discussion like this, there's no knock on the immuno-oncology, but in many of those cases, we have treatments for those diseases. When I think of Huntington's and ALS and right. things like that, we either have no treatments or we, we, we have right. things that don't work at all. Obviously, it comes to mind things like we don't have good control groups, you know, things mm -hmm. like that, but I'm curious to each of you to yep. maybe, maybe talk a little bit about your challenges that you've had specific yep. to this uh, pathway that you've gone down. Uh, okay. In part, uh, yeah. it's back to the ability to deliver therapeutic yeah. payloads yep. uh, to, the, to the right cells. So mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, with the gene therapy, we have this opportunity now to be able to, uh, to, uh, to, to do that, to improve upon uh, the ability of a small molecule or passive immunization of an antibody to cross sufficiently the blood-brain barrier to have an effect. Mm -hmm. um, it's true that uh, as we work with a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, uh, you uh, have a challenge unless you can develop good biomarkers to show uh, the uh, change in the disease course, in the progression. That's a challenge of the field. But again, as we develop potent therapies, potential cures for certain disease, it uh, gives us uh, this ability to uh, be able to capture early clinical readouts to, through you know, whether it's fluid biomarkers or imaging biomarkers, um, but that's, that's a, something that's gonna allow the field mm -hmm. to move forward. That's mm -hmm. been a, a historical challenge for neuroscience. Yeah, but can I add that I think it's more from a regulatory perspective. So our experience with the FDA when we were developing a therapeutic for Duchenne's 
Uh, the biomarkers are really frowned upon by the FDA, and uh, you could look at all the history with Sarepta and sort of all of the uh, chaos that happened with the FDA regarding the pressure by advocacy groups to use biomarkers. The FDA still wants to see functional assessments, you know, clinical endpoints with real benefit to patients. I think biomarkers are early indicators, but uh, they're still not in favor from a regulatory perspective. Yeah, from a, yeah completely agree from an yeah. approval perspective. Any other views on that? Uh, uh, I would say the obvious one is the blood-brain barrier is that yeah. challenge. Th these diseases are often diffuse diseases. They're not focal. I mean, Parkinson's starts with a focal pathology, so you can address that focal motion. The movement disorders is a focal uh, challenge. But, you know, other things, frontal temporal dementia or Alzheimer's disease, these are diffuse diseases, so you have the distribution challenge. Uh, you also have an organ that's where it's clear that neuroinflammation and uh, and the balance between an inflammatory and a suppressive environment is critical to this, but it's not clear exactly how yet. Um, so I think there's this additional, you know, a little bit we have to learn about how inflammation plays a role and how to actually control it as different from in CAR T where you just want to kill yep. something. Yep. You know, it's right, so it's uh, a little different. Yeah, many of the challenges are the same challenges that you have for any neurological program, which is how do you select the dose in a human? How do you, how do you observe your pharmacodynamic interactions. You really can't, so you look at biomarkers, make the best of what that is, but those are not gonna be regulatory endpoints. So you have those same challenges, fundamentally. Um, you have unique challenges that are associated with distribution and organ targeting and so forth. Uh, we've done a lot to overcome those challenges, so that's, that's very encouraging. And then, in the end, you just have the, the, the benefit of really being able to um, have sustained exposure, and hopefully, you know, um, targeting the right areas of the brain or the CNS. I would say one of the biggest challenges is just trying to figure out the right method, the right method of delivery. Because yeah. we have five different approaches, right, for CNS diseases that we can use. And then it's trying to figure out what are you trying to achieve for this particular disease. And one mode of delivery is not always the most relevant right. uh, across different diseases. And then sometimes there's factors like we've now seen with the VEXs in the SMA trial, sometimes just, you know, manufacturing burdens, right, can be problematic. And so while Avexis had done, uh, you know, IV injections initially, now changing perhaps to intrathecal mm -hmm. because arguably it's less of a production issue. But when you look at the different ways of delivering, right, you can do a direct injection, uh, you know, intracerebral injection. Uh, you don't get the spread, and that might be okay for certain diseases where you don't want the spread, like Parkinson's disease, arguably. But then in other diseases, you want a more spread through the CNS and PNS. And so then you look at uh, some of the other uh, options, like delivery to the uh, CSF, um, and then there's different forms of that, right? IC, ICV. Um, and intrathecal, and you have to, I mean, there's just so many yep. variables. So when you sit down and you design your trial, right, and then there's IM and there's IV, it's, it's not like uh, it's already a predetermined path. You have to be very strategic about what you're trying to achieve uh, therapeutically, what cells you're trying to hit, which cells you're trying to avoid uh, transducing, and then looking at manufacturing burden. So, there's a, and then immune system too, right? Because while you know a less evasive strategy like IV uh, is beneficial for patients, uh, it exposes them to yeah immunogenicity. Yep. So it's a very complicated yep. uh, set of factors that you have to balance. And my guess is if each of you had uh, big pharma budgets and maybe uh, uh, investors with lots of patients, you could be a, a bit more. Uh, uh, you'd have the ability to, to, to assess all those things as opposed right. to having to use the hockey analogy of one shot on goal and hopefully <laughs> making the best choice. So, That's um, You know, as the, as the chair, I, I think there are certain questions that sort of are obvious and, and ones that are expected, but I want to maybe do something a little bit different for, for some of the audience. So this is a pretty interesting group. We've got public companies and private companies. We've got founders. We've got individuals who came in later. Uh, just from a personal standpoint, I'm curious, what attracted you other than the obvious yeah. of curing diseases? Beyond yeah. that, what attracted you to go into the role or the company that you're in right yeah. now? Yeah. Yeah. Bill, you want to? Sure. Um, I think most of the people in this room are lucky enough to be able to choose what job they take. 
And for me personally, it was about having a job and a career and all those things that every human, I suppose, wants, but having a mission, having something that's worth doing. And for me, um, you know, I, I believe in this mode of therapy. I believe that it's going to be transformative. Um, and I've seen Parkinson's up close, and I want to do something about it. I've seen it three times now up close, and uh, it's just unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. We've got to do better. And I am incredibly optimistic about everything in, that we're doing, we and everybody on this panel and everybody in this room. And I think in our lifetimes, we're going to see something transformative. And I simply can't think of a better way to spend my life than to try. So that's great. Sorry Thank if that you. sounds a little no, sappy, that's but that's, it's, that's great. it is the truth. Andre, you came from Similarly. a very successful large pharma company. and Yeah, so I've out. been in the role for a year and a half at the Voyager. Um, and for me, it was a similar driver, but uh, it's, it's also the, the belief, the conviction that the, now's the right time for that the marrying of this technology, and there's enough understanding about the biology, whether it's a monogenic disease or just some good uh, understanding of the, the biology of certain diseases, that we can really have a big, big impact. And, uh, and unlike other modalities, I think you do have genuinely, if you look forward, the uh, the reason to believe we can have some cures for some of these uh, neurological conditions. Um, and I, I love some of the decisions that had been taken previously with the, this portfolio and the ones we're making now, like I mentioned earlier, to go after certain rare diseases, but also some of these more uh, common and the most common neurological diseases. Because uh, I think the, the technology is applicable to make some big impact uh, on on both of these types of manifestations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sheila, obviously you're a founder, so you've been there from the beginning, but yeah. your, your vision and the, the, uh, the, the view you've got uh, having do, been doing this now for almost two decades? So ASPIO was started by a bunch of parents who had children uh, that had some devastating diseases and uh, traditional medicine gave them no answer and these parents refused to take a death sentence for their kids. Uh, they approached uh, Jude Samalski, and one parent had a little boy, TJ, who had Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Uh, another woman had a little girl, Hannah, who had uh, GAN. And then a third parent had two daughters with Frederick's ataxia. And so um, we had no choice, right? Uh, in 2001, when the company was started, it was after the Jesse Gelsinger situation. There was no money. But I think neither Jude nor I, and I think Jude ended up with me because uh, I was very idealistic, still am, but maybe a little bit less as I age. Uh, and I saw the power of the technology and uh, I wanted to change the world, right? I didn't want people to suffer needlessly if this technology could leash um, cures and could relieve suffering. And so I worked and Jude worked uh, for, I guess, a good 15 years with no funding. Uh, and we would talk to pharmaceutical companies and we would show them that we had animals and hemophilia out for uh, you know, seven years without any bleeding. And they said, oh, it doesn't fit in our spreadsheet. What do you mean one-time treatment? We don't know how to model that. And we would talk to investors as recently as, what, five years ago when we were trying to get our Deschenes program funded. And they said, oh, this will never work. We're not going to take the risk. So it's great to be here today. But a lot of us, and I see Frazier out there, a lot of us have been doing this for a long time because we know this is revolutionary technology. And we know this is the future. It is going to displace uh, the way that we uh, have traditionally treated patients. And it's going to have such a big impact. Uh, people are going to do better. They're going to feel better. They're going to live better. Mm -hmm. yeah, well said. John, you joined in yeah, the last so three years. So. Absolutely. I'm more recent into the, into the area. And I would certainly echo the comments about the inspiration you know, for getting into this field. It also happened about four years ago when I got into it. The, the field was coming out of really a desert of, of challenge that uh, often new technologies go through. And the Jesse Gelsinger situation certainly didn't help. Um, and, and at that time I started, I really believed that this was ready to take off, really ready to realize its potential. And as it turned out, it has exploded. And that's fantastic. So I felt that the timing was really good. And it really has been the case. And that's very, very rewarding. Well, thanks to all four of you for those comments. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got our fearless leader sitting here up in the front. and. Uh, 
you know, I think the passion, you know, that, that goes into this field is second to none. And I think if there's, you know, the successes are the successes, but I think for the people that aren't in this on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't get the personal story mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, that we know is behind each one of these uh, uh, particular journeys. And uh, knowing, because we have discussions that we're reminded also all the time on when we get the opportunity to visit or get visit, visits from uh, the patients yeah. for some of the, the programs that uh, we're, we're looking to find solution. Uh, that's that to to all of our colleagues in our companies that makes a, an incredible impact. Mm -hmm. uh, so to to work on a, a therapy that uh, has that potential to have that big mm -hmm. big impact, uh, you have them uh, on your side sharing. There's that urgency, that the, that understanding of what it's like uh, to uh, to live with their condition. So uh, these reminders, it's it's a great thing Absolutely. that in our industry these reminders are. Uh, are there often uh, for us to, uh, to drive our effort. Mm -hmm. Turning to the more mundane, the regulatory, um, you know, I, I think the typical advice you get is go early, go often, and that probably is, uh, you know, it goes across every area of drug development. But, you know, in many ways, you've been the, uh, uh, the pathfinders or the trailblazers in the neurospace for some of the diseases you're talking about. I wonder specific if there's any, any advice or any guidance, somebody new to the field just thinking about developing a, uh, a gene or cell program in neuro, what would you tell them about, about your regulatory interactions and what you've learned from it, what you might do different today? Um, Jill, you want to start? Yeah, I would not think of the FDA as the enemy. Um, you know, in the early days of this field, they actually were very supportive and I think that they have really uh, helped the field progress. And, uh, so I actually think, again, you know, you want to engage them and involve them in developing your pivotal endpoints for sure. You definitely want to take advantage of the Interact meeting, uh, get their feedback uh, early on the development of your clinical trial design. Um, I would be careful about biomarkers because uh, they've uh, indicated several times that uh, they haven't really bought into biomarkers uh, as a clinical endpoint. They really want to see the functional assessments and you know the clinical endpoints that show benefit to patients. Um, so I think those are the key things. The other thing I would say is be aware of everything that's going on in your indication. So be aware of what's going on with the small molecules and the protein therapeutics and leverage off of what's happening there and build that into your regulatory strategy. Um, you know, we have lots of competition. It's just not the other gene therapy folks or the, sorry, the cell therapy folks. It, it really is a much wider uh, group of competitive forces. But what they're doing, right, in getting their drugs approved can be learning points for, mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, views? Um, I mean, the, we, we know that for a fact that the patient perspective is also valued by the agency. Uh, so for these diseases, you start these early interactions. Uh, they do want to get uh, the opportunity to consider uh, endpoints uh, and the disease burden uh, from a patient perspective. So that's, that's always uh, uh, something that as we move forward with new programs, we're going to look to integrate. Yeah, the FDA has been very encouraging about, about yeah. engagement, and, yeah. and you should definitely take them up on it. They've also been very helpful and not punitive in, in the way that they have guided and, and the things that they are they're trying to help. They're trying to be a partner right. in this area, and, and that's been a tremendously positive experience. Yeah. yeah, and I think interesting point, John, we tend to think in terms here at least of the FDA, but obviously we've got EMA, Health Canada, you know, the ministry, et cetera, of other places is at least in our interactions, I, I agree with everything all, all of you said, you know, what we are starting to see is more consistency across uh, organizations, whereas in the uh, earlier days, maybe just four or five or six years ago, we would see one set of uh, guidance come from one regulatory agency, and then you'd go to a second one, and it would be I either inconsistent or sometimes completely opposite, and you were left scratching your head of, okay, how do we handle this, other than not doing the study in that region, which <laughs> is what many companies ultimately did. If they didn't get the advice they were looking for, or the suggestions, they sometimes would run from it, at least right. for the proof of concept. But A right. um, couple of uh, comments have been made already about study design, but I, I think, as we alluded to earlier, this, these fields are ones where there are not many currently approved therapies, so we don't have necessarily endpoints that have already been uh, 
uh, vetted and agreed upon. We don't have mm -hmm. uh, 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 assessments, neurocognitive assessments that have that there's a, an agreement. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. You've made the point, Sheila, about the biomarker challenges. But I'm just wondering, on the study design front, are there things that you could impart to the to the audience that you would suggest? Either you do this, you would do it over again the way you have, or you would consider something different. Uh, maybe start at the end there, Andre. You want to? Yeah. So I mean, we we in the rare disease uh, where we work in uh, Friedrich's ataxia and Huntington's, the patient associations have been uh, uh, very helpful again in the, in making sure that the abreast of uh, the guidance that's given to the industry, uh, so that we learn as a field and that they in their role help uh, the field uh, uh, advance. Uh, so that's, they've been uh, close partners. Uh, I'd say the same for the Fox Foundation uh, in Parkinson's, which is not a rare yeah. disease, but uh, their desire to see uh, gene therapy intervention uh, uh, be developed, uh, they can play an important role. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So ac across the spectrum of the programs where, where uh, uh, we're, we have these types of interactions. We think that's going to be an important uh, mm -hmm. uh, component. Yeah. Emil? Yeah, we, um, we, in our lead, proposed lead program, um, we have the benefit of almost 400 people over the last 20 to 30 years that have been treated with fetal cell transplants. Uh, which is not what we do, but which does inform you quite a bit mm -hmm. on uh, study design from patient selection to immunosuppression protocols to the, the, re the outcomes. And uh, so we've, we've learned a lot from that. Our founder, uh, Lauren Studer, helped to assemble um, an academic consortium called GeForce, which has spent the better part of five or six years now poring over that data and coming up with uh, best practices study design that includes how do you select the patients, what are the inclusion and exclusion criteria, and what are the metrics you're using. And um, So, you know, we've, we, we, we're lucky in that our lead program in Parkinson's, uh, when we do enter the clinic, will benefit from a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other views, so John? Well, I'd say that by and large, the study design has, doesn't really change with gene therapy very much, at least the, the high-level aspects of it. There may be a few details in the in the design that are somewhat different, but you're you're really looking at the same endpoints you would otherwise, and you're you're looking for the same side effects and, and safety uh, mm -hmm. criteria as well. So that part isn't very different. But we also have the benefit of a uh, orphan area that has yeah. had a lot of cooperation by the FDA as well to try to get things to advance in the absence of large populations and, and a lot of data and so forth. So um, with gene therapy, the clinical design isn't really very effective. Mm -hmm. So I have one point I'd like to make. And I think, uh, again, we've learned a lot from the SMA trials. Uh, one thing that I think uh, is evident, and we've seen this too in our own advancement in the clinic, if we can treat earlier, it's better. So for genetic defects, uh, you avoid issues associated with the immune system if you go earlier. Manufacturing burdens are less uh, burdensome. Um, and uh, fundamentally, you just have a much greater impact. Uh, as the disease progresses, it's harder to rescue and rejuvenate. Uh, neurons in particular, right? Uh, and so, uh, again, earlier is better on your genetic diseases. That's a really interesting point. Andre, I want to circle back to something you said. Uh, my firm, uh, we've been in the rare diseases for our, our entire 20 years. And one of the things that we've seen that's really been impactful and changed in the last 10 years, not specific to gene and cell therapy, but in rare diseases is the issue of social media. Uh, you know, it used to be, we said to, to uh, uh, anybody in the industry, be quiet, start your program, be under the radar screen, get your results, then go out there and trumpet the results. Now, before you even start, you know, whether it's the advocacy groups, the key opinion yeah. leaders, uh, the, the academic centers of excellence, they know about it about as soon as you do, and they're approaching <laughs> you saying, we have patients, right. or I am a patient, and it's interesting right. to see how social media, I think, has changed for the positive, the identification of these rare disease populations, maybe even guided us as to which countries, which centers we should consider opening for studies, so I, I do think that's an interesting observation as well. Yeah, it's a great observation. Uh, and, and they are, uh, that's a big enabler for us to, to be better connected to that patient community. Uh, they are eager to uh, get information about the different uh, ther therapeutic modalities, to learn about gene therapy in the case uh, where it's relevant uh, here. Uh, I think it accelerates uh, 
what we can do uh, in terms of movement into the clinic, um, this ability to, uh, to engage through social media and the way that uh, they are staying informed even as we work preclinically on our programs. Uh, it, so it, it can certainly shift. cause some interesting things in the open label studies yeah. because the, obviously the yeah. data can sometimes uh, be uh, yeah. communicated mm -hmm. or misconstrued. Mm -hmm. uh, right. No, absolutely. So I think there's, uh, and, and one thing that's true is that uh, any comment made in any, any setting that uh, it's always, I mean, our primary audience is looking to, to, to find solutions for these, uh, these issues. So whether you're in an investor uh, setting, uh, a, a meeting uh, like this, uh, or uh, speaking with uh, the patient, uh, it, everything in the end, uh, information is shared. Um, so it's important uh, to, uh, to, to understand how, how to make, best right. make this. Uh, yeah, yeah, but there's also a risk, I think. I think yeah. in some ways, right, we're over-hyping the programs before we have the clinical data. And our uh, phase one, two usually have just a few patients. Mm -hmm. I think, unfortunately, um, a lot of people are very desperate, uh, parents in particular, where there's no treatment for a lot of these devastating diseases. And we have to be careful not to use social media to uh, overhype, right, <laughs> a few clinical uh, data points. Um, I mean, you can even see now in the Duchenne's uh, trials with the uh, complementary uh, cascade issue on a few patients being identified. It's not a slam dunk yet. The science is still evolving as we extrapolate to larger numbers. There are gonna be unexpected things that occur. And I think we should just be responsible in the messages that we're communicating. It's exciting. Uh, it has a lot of potential. Um, but everybody should be aware that there will be some problems. There will be hurdles along the way. And to overpromise, uh, you know, the results, I think, does a disservice to the field. And we've already had enough difficulties in this field. We don't need any more uh, setbacks like that. But also to patients and parents who are desperate for answers. We just have to be careful about what we communicate. And as you know, many times, Sheila, I mean, your point is dead on, but sometimes it's not the company that's doing this. It ends up being some you know, individuals, and unfortunately, they take on a life of their own, and, and we're dealing with it. Exactly. So. We can. There, there, although it's not necessarily social media, there are some very well-organized patient organizations that, that can be extremely, extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. and, and Huntington's disease, there's a patient organization that actually put, that work, came together and made itself available to companies advising them on their trials, giving patient experience, helping to identify patients to including trials and many, many other things that was pre-available, pre, uh, pre essentially, and already prepared for companies to then take advantage of. Something like that, if it's done well and properly and, and not you know, taking um, information inappropriately, spreading it and so forth, it is really very, very powerful. So I think, like anything, if it's used yep. the right way, it's, it's very good. If not, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I want to ask a selfish question here because I want to learn from the four of you. We touched on this a, just a little bit, but the neurocognitive assessments, which are so critical to you know, putting, putting something quantifiable about your treatments, uh, as you mentioned, beyond the biomarkers, um, what is your recommendation today? We've seen it go from a lot of local neurocognitive assessments yeah. to centralized to maybe a swing back. And we, I don't know that there's a standard, but I'm curious yeah. if either any of you have a, a strong opinion or have had experience where you'd make a recommendation on that. I wouldn't make, rec make a recommendation <laughs> on that. I'd say we're, we're specifically not addressing the cognitive uh, side of Parkinson's in the LEAD program. Where we're, we're focused on the motor control deficit. So uh, the endpoints, the study design, uh, inclusion and exclusion, mm -hmm. all the measurements, everything are focused on the motion, on the movement disorders. Yeah, so our LEAD program also in Parkinson, it's mm -hmm. the same uh, development approach. I mean, you do have some capture of some of the other mm -hmm. uh, uh, morbidities uh, that mm -hmm. uh, the, that come with the disease that are captured in some of the broader assessments, but uh, the the main uh, endpoints we're capturing are motor function endpoints. Do any of you see uh, wearables, implantables uh, in the in the near future for your development programs? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, one last question, and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, for the last uh, 15 minutes or so. But I wonder if, if any of you can speak, and, and obviously we're you know, in relatively early clinical programs here, but we do have some, some uh, pivotal uh, programs that are being initiated. But the, the value proposition for the payers, mm -hmm. what, have, what have your firms been thinking? Have you engaged in those discussions? How yeah. important is, is, is data for this discussion? Uh, you know, just where are you and what, what advice uh, or counsel would you give to, to, uh, to others yeah. about that? Uh, I would say that I'm, I'm great, deeply appreciative of the fact that there are pioneers ahead of us ch charging forward on some of these issues. Um, so, uh, but I think you know, the most important value proposition here is that we're talking about neurodegenerative diseases where there is no disease-modifying treatment. These patients have very little, uh, you know, uh, very few options. So from a payer's point of view, it's a very, if you have efficacy, I think you have a different kind of conversation. Um, that would be the first thing. The, the, obvi the other obvious thing is it's a one-time, we hope, all of us hope, it's a one-time mm -hmm. durable benefit. So that's something profoundly uh, valuable and important. So uh, we, we are not engaged in that yet because it's too early for us. We're not even in a trial yet. So, um, but you know, I think those would be the kinds of things, should we be lucky enough to get there, that uh, it'll be the topic of the conversation. So I think I have a very contrarian view on it. I'm actually not happy that we're charging so much for our therapeutics. I understand the value proposition in one-time treatment, but I want our drugs to be accessible. I don't want our drugs just to be accessible to people in the US and in Europe. I want our drugs to be accessible to every child that needs them wherever they may be located. And so as a CEO, what I do, and I'm sure my investors are not happy to hear that <laughs> message, <laughs> but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to drive down costs. Manufacturing is still a significant part of our cost. It's 60% of our cost of goods. So how do I get manufacturing costs down? I gotta increase the yield. And Fraser, we were talking earlier about stable package cell line. I'm working like crazy, get a stable package cell line. Not in the R&D phase, not in the clinical phase, but in the commercial phase, right? And I'm looking at other ways. Uh, plasma right now is very expensive. It's 40% of our cost of uh, manufacturing. And so how do I drive down the plasma cost? And we've been looking at different ways of doing that. How do I reduce cycle times? Because cycle times and time is money. And then at the back end, how do I make sure we avoid negative 80 degree cold storage? And you know, I'm thinking for Duchenne's, it would have been football fields, right, of, of uh, refrigerators holding vials of this therapeutic. So we've invested in a technology like the Listerine film strip that you put on your tongue. We can dry down AV into that. AV is a very robust little virus. And we can reconstitute it without losing any potency. And now, instead of having freezers at negative 80 degrees, we have reams of paper that we you know, can store the virus at room temperature. And that means now I can distribute therapeutics to the third world, because those kids deserve mm -hmm. these therapeutics too. So I think I have a little bit different perspective. I hope we can make the cost of goods a lot lower so then we can treat all these pathway diseases, right? We're de-risking the technology in the monogenetic diseases. And thank, thank you, right? Parents and kids who are, are doing that for us, you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. But in the future, we're gonna be treating pathway diseases. Yep. It's gonna be heart failure and Parkinson's, and the healthcare system cannot afford these price tags. It just can't happen. And so, um, yeah, I hope it's a different world in the future. Well, I think a couple of the earlier sessions today that I heard, the discussion got into competitive landscape. And obviously, if you're the first and only, you know, it's different, but, but certainly just across this panel, obviously, we have some competing you know, technologies in similar diseases. So to your point, uh, the, the free market may actually ultimately play a role here in, on pricing and reimbursement And that's strategies. not a bad thing. No, exactly. It's not a bad thing. And here, John, do you have a Well, certainly from a value proposition perspective, there's no question that neurodegenerative diseases in particular really don't have any strong treatments right now. There's some symptomatic therapies here and there, but there's a huge unmet need. So clearly that's a key component of of the value that you're bringing to, to, to patients that, that uh, is, I think, very tangible. Uh, but it does take time to demonstrate it. And, and the extent, are you, are you halting the course of a disease? Yep. Are you reversing the course of disease? Or are you slowing the course of the disease? I mean, that's going to be the first question that really comes up when you look at your value proposition. And those are 
three very distinct different value propositions. So I think part of it is we need what to do? demonstrate yep. the value and what does that look like. And then we can talk a little bit more about all the components that factor in over and beyond you know, the, uh, the, that, that obvious um, improvement of the quality of life, improvement of uh, patients' lives. Um, but I think that's the first thing to really understand about these disorders and the treatments, and that really still needs to play out. Any other uh, views? I think one of the interesting things I heard, uh, and this was probably six or seven, maybe even eight years ago over in Europe, uh, it was a reimbursement panel, one of the early ARM programs over there that I happened to be chairing, and, and it was payers from several of the, of the uh, European countries, and we got into what was viewed, at least from the U.S. perspective, as something very controversial, which was risk sharing and deferred payment. Yeah. And across the board, seven or eight years ago, they all said, well, we, we can live with that. We're a one-payer system, mm -hmm. and, and if you show us you can deliver, we're willing to pay premiums for it. You know, it took us a half a dozen years and somebody like Bluebird to maybe get out on front on, on that type of an idea here, but it clearly is, it, I think it's something that's going to be incorporated in a lot of decision making going forward. I think mm -hmm. so. There are a lot of structural challenges. Mm -hmm. to Absolutely. Still, but nevertheless, not the um, least the of which is yeah, very strong. Somebody pointed out earlier the issue in our in our American system where we change healthcare providers yeah, on a regular yeah, basis is, is yeah. a challenge. But even in Europe, there yep. yeah. um, So we've got time for the audience. I, I would certainly encourage you to take advantage. This is a. Uh, a panel that can probably solve any question or problem that you have out there. Uh, one of the four, maybe all four, so. Got one over there. Can you line up the second question can, over here somewhere? Cube. Yeah. We, can, we should just pass it, exactly. Yeah. Just pass it around. It's yes, like how are you? Like Thank you so much for a, for a great panel discussion. I would love to hear a little bit more on that last point. You're talking really about the development of much longer term data in regard to the value of our therapies. And I wonder if, if some of you might like to comment on how you're going about that in one or two of the specific programs that you're working on. I've seen registry elements going on for decades with things that I've worked with. And as a neurologist, I've seen a lot of these measures develop over time. But I really think it is exciting to see you all having this specific discussion today. I think it's really meaningful and will underscore a lot of the reimbursement challenge and other issues that we're talking about in the next two years. That's a good point. So our lead program for Parkinson's, uh, we've, we are starting relatively early with that uh, overall evidence generation. So the, the pivotal is placebo control, so there's a sham surgery, and that's gonna be ultimately our best evidence of the impact it has on the disease. But we have uh, clinical experience uh, some years out now, some patients were treated years ago uh, with, in a phase one, uh, open label. So to have some the appropriate natural history uh, matching cohorts uh, and prospective work so that uh, these, all this precious uh, data, that long-term efficacy can be put in a better context is one way that we are mm -hmm. investing in the evidence generation. Because ultimately, a uh, primary endpoint for us may be uh, 12 months for a pivotal readout, but uh, It'd be a shame not to have uh, the four or five year data reasonably well matched to better understand the long term right. impact mm -hmm. of the therapy. Yeah, I think it's very critical to be able to have long term data, and the way to generate long term data is to generate it. In other words, it takes time. But, but your phase one, two study is, is essential, and, and so you want to be able to have that connection. Um, you, you may be able to draw some connections in a somewhat modular way to even longer term data that you may have with the same capsid um, that, that may speak to certain aspects of the immunogenicity of that particular capsid and other, other aspects. But when it really comes to how long does the effect endure in these patients, you, you just need to be able to think about that as you start your phase one, two, because that's going to be your long term data. Yeah, and I think it obviously differs, too, by disease state. So CNS, you're going to have a longer-term effect, it's expected, than in the liver or uh, even maybe in muscle, right, where there's mm -hmm. going to be turnover of the tissue. And so to say that there would not be a, a need for redosing in those other tissues, I think, is a bit naive. Um, but, you know, gene therapy, too, we have an obligation from the regulatory perspective to have longer-term follow-up. 
And so in some ways, we should be collecting that data just as a requirement for you know, the regulatory authorities. Yeah. Sheila, I wanted to, uh, that question prompted that thinking for me. You know, if the five of us tomorrow started a company and we had a small molecule and we got six months or two years into it, decided that it wasn't successful, we folded up the company, we, we were acquired, we went, whatever happened, there would be very little legacy of that molecule. But to your point, we're finding companies, you know, in a proof of concept, sometime investigator initiated program where only one or two or three subjects are treated, that depending on the geography you're conducting your study, you may be obligated to follow those subjects five years, mm -hmm. 10 years, 15, yeah. 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so I think that's a complete different way. I'm not a, right. an, I, I certainly, we agree with that philosophy, but it's very right. different than other drug development, which, mm -hmm. you know, certainly puts a, a high premium on uh, how many patients, how long, and what data are you yep. going to get. Yeah. There is no such thing as a loss to follow up, we say, mm -hmm. in, a, in a gene or cell therapy program. Right. It's just a missing patient, <laughs> soon to be found. <laughs> I think we have another question here. So, um, okay. Thank you very much for stimulating a uh, very stimulating discussion. You know, uh, Sheila, especially you know for cutting to the chase and several of these issues that have been out there for a long time and they're very important. Um, I do have a question about immunology, and I think you'd brought it up, and there was discussion around um, uh, about the immunology. And I guess the concept that in many of these one and done scenarios, a flip side of it is these subjects who actually do receive a gene therapy, especially a viral vector gene therapy, probably cannot be retreated, at least with our current technologies. So I think there's a really high bar to try to do our very best. Um, I'm not sure uh, if any of the uh, panel members could comment on um, how we should view this. Are there you know, decisions that are made in the vector design, maybe the manufacturing processes, HEK versus Baculo, you know, these are decisions that happened to ensure that we avoid you know, trying to um, to uh, permanently altering, uh, you know, patients so that they can't really participate subsequently. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're mm -hmm. trying to move forward in the field in general. We need that information, yeah. but I think it's a bit of a gnarly yeah. issue. Yeah. yeah. Well, in, in AAV gene therapy, <laughs> I would just make the comment that we've demonstrated the ability to retreat in animals uh, for a number of reasons, but you, with with a immunoabsorption-based technology uh, to create a window, and a lot of it has to do with our particular chosen vector that has qualities that allow it. For one thing, you don't have a T cell response, you only have an antibody response. Mm -hmm. that, that's what we've demonstrated and others as well, working with AEV5. And as a result, you don't have, you, if you can knock down the antibody response, you may be able to retreat. So I would, I would first and foremost say, I think retreatment will be, will yeah. be available. And so yeah. that may be the key point to make, right. but yeah. In some yeah. ways, it reminds me of conversations 30 years ago with the first monoclonal antibodies, where we said, you know, the early ones were murine and then they were chimeric and uh, CDR grafted and things. And we said, you can't be retreated. And obviously, over time, we found out that one, many could be depending on idiotype yeah. or isotypic yeah. responses. And two, we found out we didn't need to retreat them because different therapies came along. Yeah. But I, I do think it's an interesting uh, a question yeah. in some of these diseases. Yeah, and so at AspBio, we're working on retreating strategy, retreatment strategies. So uh, we do believe that retreatment will be necessary for liver and for muscle. And so as a consequence, uh, we announced a deal with Selecta. That's one strategy. Uh, we have another strategy we're going to be announcing uh, shortly. Uh, there's always ways of having different capsids, uh, one that's uh, distinct enough from the first one where you could have retreatment. Barry Burns has uh, some ideas on immunomodulation. So there's a lot of different strategies. We're going to work it out as a field. There's no doubt about it. We'll, yeah. we'll be able to do retreatment. I agree. Yeah, I, mean, I think the, the question for us is a little different because we obviously, I guess the corollary would be HLA sensitization or something if you were to try to redose with a cell. Uh, but, you know, the evidence today suggests, at least in the fetal cell trials, that um, there were 400 people treated with these fetal cell transplants, and there were many experiments within these 400. There were many sites around the world, and they, so you can't really aggregate all the data. But um, in some of those cases, people were weaned off L-DOPA, and 20 years later still had robust grafts in their midbrain. So we know that the graft can persist and that um, it does not require retreatment. That it, you know, The question is why in some patients it was 20 years and the graft was still robust and it was there versus in others it didn't persist. Um, but you know, we don't, you know, we don't um, anticipate having to redose. Yeah, and Frazier, I would say the bigger question, though, is the pre-existing neutralizing antibody, right? I think that's a bigger hurdle mm -hmm. right now for patients. And uh, how do we make sure 
for a given you know, therapeutic that as many patients as possible can actually get it. And so I think uh, that's the bigger technical struggle today. Uh, that's where you know, we scratch our head a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Time, maybe one or two more. I see any others here? Somebody not. Take the call. No more. If not, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the panel for uh, their insight and their participation. And I think the passion that you have for the field is terrific. And I feel really good the fact that we've got people like you leading the, the neuro indications moving forward. So thank you very much. Thank you.